So this evening, thank you very much for joining me on this lovely evening to talk about um, the use of the MLS class 4 laser in anal sacculitis. Um, we're going to be using, whether you've got it in practice already, um, we're going to be using the MLS laser um, and I can show you some settings on there that I find to be the most useful and I have my patient sitting right here next to me so hopefully she will be a useful demonstration model uh, in due course. So we'll talk about how the laser can help reduce pain and inflammation um, in anal gland disease. Uh, we'll also talk about then uh, settings for and symptoms of acute anal sacculitis. Um, we'll talk about management of chronic anal gland disease and abscess management and how the laser can help. And finally touch on uh, perianal fistulas. I've also got a video of use in exotic species, so I'll leave you to ponder what that exotic species might be until the end. And we've got a practical demonstration as well. So uh, laser therapy, low level light therapy, LLLT or photobiomodulation um, is, is what it's known as. And with the class four MLS laser, it provides a painless, non-invasive, non-toxic, easily deliverable um, uh, service for the client and um, the patient. It accelerates healing, uh, provides analgesia, and it decreases inflammation. And there's no side effects as long as you're sticking to the protocols uh, that uh, we discuss, um, which I'll get, move on to. So it works by photostimulation of the cytochrome C in mitochondria, and this leads to a number of different mechanisms that can help in wound healing and control of um, disease. Uh, increasing nitric oxide, helping to improve angiogenesis and vasodilation. Uh, primarily it increases ATP within the cell, which is there for energy for cell repair. It also has been shown to have effects on fibroblasts to help with healing and scar formation. Um, it increases reactive oxygen species, so helping in the endogenous antioxidant enzyme pathways. It is also been shown to reduce inflammatory cytokines, so interleukin-1, interleukin-6, human necrosis factor alpha. And um, we've also got reduction uh, via the COX-2 pathway um, uh, via reduced mRNA expression of uh, COX-2. Um, and this all acts as, as a local effect. You do need to make sure that you're getting informed consent from um, the client, especially in the moment. Usually what we would do is use the laser in the presence of the owner and give them protective eyewear to, to wear so they can see that it's not a painful and it's a generally quite pleasant um, treatment to have. Um, obviously we can't do that at the moment. So um, it is patented to reduce pain, swelling and inflammation, most importantly for the handler and potentially the patient, particularly if you're treating around the head, not so important with any gland disease for eye protection for the patient. Um, you can see in the picture, we've got some doggles there. Um, making sure, importantly, that they may be scattered from the floor or other reflective surfaces. Um, particular contraindications that we do need to bear in mind is if there's any neoplastic tissue. It's been shown in certain studies not to increase cell lines uh, and growth of, of cancer cells, um, but because there isn't proof of no harm and with its effect on angiogenesis, that's why we advise against use when there is no neoplasia present. So the benefits of MLS class 4 laser, uh, you get pulsed emissions um, and the reason um, that they're pulsed is that prevents thermal damage of the tissues. So there's no issue even when you're holding the probe still of um, thermal damage to the tissues and this means it can penetrate much more effectively um, the top layer of, of the skin, even up to four centimetres. So this is why it's really useful for anal gland disease because it's not just treating the surface. You can deliver it in a contact or a non-contact way. Um, you can max, it, it helps to maximise results and stabilise the condition. 
Um, you get analgesia, and that's from the first application. Uh, it reduces inflammation um, to promote resolution of the wound or abrasions in the area. Helps to reduce the swelling and edema associated with anal gland disease. Stimulates collagen synthesis to speed up wound, wound healing. And so the, all these in turn mean that you're less reliant on medications. Hopefully you can reduce your use of antibiotics and therefore have less side effects overall. So what is anal gland disease? Uh, acute anal sacculitis. You've got the sebaceous glands at four o'clock and eight o'clock. Um, under the bottom of the tail um, with ducts at two o'clock and ten o'clock just inside the anal sphincter. Um, the actual um, you, uh, reason that um, dogs and cats have sebaceous glands and other animals is thought to be, it's not known, but it's thought to be used in territory marking and communication. So when they pass feces, they will deposit some of the sebaceous band secretion and that will help in marking territory. Um, they can be a range of colours that can be normal, uh, ranging from clear to yellow to brown to pasty. But when you do get thicker secretions, that's when you tend to get blockages because it can't pass through the ducts normally when the animal is going to the toilet. Um, we're in a survey of 3,000 dogs done many years ago now, 12.5 dogs had some degree of anal gland disease. So the signs that we tend to see, it might be scooting, but often it might just be licking or chewing around the tail head. Um, they might have superficial perineal abrasions where they have been rubbing or licking. Um, it, that might then escalate to self-trauma and they tend to be acutely painful and in discomfort. So that picture that we see is very common of that, that dog moving around the house or around the garden, trying to get some relief from the very painful area at some, um, when he's um, trying to go to the toilet. So there's lots of different causes for anal gland disease, acute anal gland disease. Thought to be, it could be just related to the hypersecretion of the glands. Often it commonly occurs either after an episode of constipation or after they've had chronic diarrhea, uh, because the normal process where the feces will help drain those glands doesn't happen, and so they can get filled up. You can get breed-related issues of laxity of the anal sphincters, or narrowed and in poor foot ducts, or it could be food allergy related. Generally, you diagnose it on the history and the clinical signs. It's important to perform a rectal exam to rule out any signs of neoplasia, any squamous cell carcinoma there. Um, you can do cytology and culture um, to identify what, uh, if there is an infection there. Um, in general, manual expression will help um, uh, solve the problem, but that in itself can cause more pain and inflammation and if the dog is already or cat is very painful it can be very difficult to do that without sedation. What you will find that when you're using MLS laser on these patients because it reduces the pain and inflammation it is a viable alternative to using steroids and non-steroid laws. Um, particularly if there's a history of diarrhea you may not want to use those medications it's been shown in arthritis that laser is as effective as uh, non-steroidals so over a six week period when you're using it regularly. Uh, so what your dosage is, you'll usually use to treat um, the lesions around the tail and the anal sacs is between two and six joules per centimeter squared. So usually when I'll show you shortly, um, the general setting will be two joules per centimetre squared um, on anal gland disease setting. Um, it is higher when you use the infected setting, um, but you can increase that up to these sorts of levels, up to six, quite um, effectively. And there's been anecdotal reports that laser treatment either um, can lead to reduced patient discomfort and less resistance um, to manual drainage um, I've certainly seen much faster wound healing 
and the patient tolerates and then next time when you do have to express their glands far more than when you haven't used laser. So uh, the next uh, disease we'll discuss is chronic anal gland disease and abscessation. So often we don't see them when they're at, at this um, uh, level just here because they've already um, come into the clinic and they've opened up and you already get draining um, noxious purulent material um, coming out from um, uh, around the perineum. Um, usually you'll then use systemic and sometimes topical antibiotics. Sometimes you'll use sedation. You'll use anti-inflammatories. Hopefully you'll also use something that will provide some analgesia and they can be extremely painful. You may need to do repeated manual expression and this sometimes does need to be done under sedation with flushing with saline. You may well then get a sample to send off to the lab to make sure that the antibiotics you're using are going to be effective. Either when they are sedated, you can then use laser in this area. So you can treat not only the abscess, but also you can see with this dog, you've got excoriations all the way going up the tail. So you can use um, the, the laser on these areas to help settle these itchy, painful areas down so that the dog will become much more comfortable more quickly. You tend to start off using it every other day for an induction period. Usually one, uh, two or three sessions is sufficient. Then twice a week, until you can reduce the number of times that you're, you need to express the anal glands. Um, once treatment response is seen, you can then go um, and extend your treatment interval. Uh, so I've got another couple of slides on perianal fistulas. Uh, this is a really chronic, horrendous condition to have to treat. Um, it has been shown to be, uh, there's a breed disposition um, for it, you get, um, uh, clinical signs of uh, malodorous lesions, tenesmus, hematochesia, dyskesia, and elevation of the tail can be extremely painful and sometimes sedation is the only thing you can do to help manage this. Standard of care, medical care, has been shown extensively studied. Um, there's a really good summary done in 2019 of uh, what you should be doing medically um, cyclosporin would be the standard treatment, plus or minus ketoconazole, and then topical tracrolimus. Prognosis can be guarded, and recurrence is very common. Um, so even with the, that standard of treatment, it can sometimes be really painful. Um, you, it should, laser should be used in these cases in addition to medical management, and it will really help to reduce the pain it will help the fistulas to try to heal and you can get a significant improvement in the quality of life. You may well need to be using much higher doses than would be standard for any gland disease, so 12 to 14 joules per centimetre squared. You would want to use perianal fistula infected setting. To get these doses, you may also then want to treat the area affected with the pain setting or often the inflammation setting as well. So then you're gonna be getting up to these sorts of levels of laser. So there we go. We've got those slides uh, with that detail there. And there's the detail of the laser protocol. So I will try now just to uh, link into this video here. Um, we have got uh, a video here of treating a perianal fistula in a um, ferret. you see that video? We can, yeah. So 
this is with the old MLS later, so it has a slightly different head. Uh, it works in exactly the same way. So significant improvement after the uh, course of therapy. So I will try and um, go back onto the other video we have. So that was the ultrasound image that they performed with Skippy. The skin was disinfected and they started using laser therapy um, every other day. Um, and it really helped with speeding the healing of this nasty uh, abscessed area of skin after only um, three, tri four treatments, so that was a week after, it was already um, sealed, the skin. And the healing you tend to get is a lot more effective after you've been using laser, it's a lot um, stronger. So, yeah. your fistula setting here and you can see that will give you uh, just under two joules per centimeter squared if you go on to the infected setting you can see it is very similar with the joules per second but you achieve that in half the time so if you felt that you needed a little bit more energy um, maybe there was an abscess on both sides or there was a lot of swelling going on around the gland you would then press CPW and that would increase your joules per centimetre squared. I would normally use it on point setting, whereas if you're on scan mode, it would take a lot longer and you'd still achieve a similar joules per centimetre squared. So I would have the preset on pulse mode. You press start. And you would get your patient, and hopefully she's going to behave. And at that point, I would press start. This would be ready to go. I would put my glasses on. I'm not actually going to use the laser today with her. Um, and you could then either use a technique to hover the laser over about a centimetre from the area that you want to treat, just here. And you would do that for in, in up to six points. So it would be, if it was infected, it would just be 30 seconds that you'd be holding the laser still. If it was inflammation, you'd then be holding the laser um, in six different points, three on each side. And you could hold the laser getting and moving it around. If you find the patient is, not very settled, mm. then sometimes you can get someone to hold the tail gently out um, and then just hover the laser off the skin and it will still penetrate the skin even if you're um, a centimetre away the area you're looking to treat. Okay. So I think that's everything for this evening.